Hello, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. Good morning, good morning, sir. Sir. Good morning to the participants of the 10th Senior Executive Course on National Security. <coughs> and at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. De Leon, Dr. De Leon, President of the NDCP, for making me a part of uh, your program today. Now today, I'll be talking about the South China Sea security situation. And uh, I'll be tackling this from the viewpoint of the military, from uh, the geopolitical uh, viewpoint, and even from the international politics uh, viewpoint. And as I talk, the topic is very light. Uh, I don't know, maybe even before I finish my uh, talk, something might happen. So it might change the situation. Uh, it's one of uh, the most interesting geopolitical topics today. And it is right in our backyard or front yard. This is uh, the South China Sea. You can see from uh, pictures. And the South China Sea is uh, bounded by the Philippines to the east, then Brunei and Malaysia uh, to the south, then uh, Vietnam to the west, and China uh, to the north. These are the so-called coastal states of the South uh, China Sea. And if you look at the blue lines there, the blue lines, uh, the broken lines, represent the EEC of the various coastal states. And uh, the red line is the so-called Nine Gas Line, uh, the claim of China that they own practically the entire South China Sea, going, uh, including well within the exclusive economic zone of the coastal states. And uh, you can see here the depiction by blacks of the various occupants of the many features inside the, the South China Sea. You can see the blacks of uh, China, uh, uh, Taiwan, Philippines, Vietnam, Brunei, and uh, Malaysia. My personal involvement in the South China Sea or strategic issue goes back a long way. Here's a picture of me, part of a secret mission back in 1971. I was a press graduate of the Naval Academy at that time, when uh, we occupied uh, many islands, uh, several islands there, and uh, transported troops, equipment, supplies, weapons. Uh, that's, uh, that's me about 30 pounds ago. <laughs> one year, uh, in fact, it's about one year after graduation. Another picture. The first major move of China into the Philippine Exclusive Economic Zone from 1971 to this uh, date in 1994 was relatively quiet. There was practically no major movement there. But in 1994, we woke up with uh, China uh, having constructed what they call temporary shelters. And when the Philippines protested, they said, don't worry about it because these are just temporary structures for the Chinese fishermen and everybody can use it. So the controversy quieted down. And Mr. Brief, this was in uh, Mr. Brief, well within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines, about 130 nautical miles from Palawan. But in 1999, they started constructing permanent concrete structures. I was one of the first who saw this also because we flew over the area on board a C-130. We flew at about 500 uh, feet. And uh, I saw with my own eyes. Wala pang iPhone on, wala pang smartphone. And uh, you know, on a picture, we saw a lot of uh, Chinese uh, workers using uh, welders. So I knew that something permanent and something big was under construction. And this was the result of that. This was the original. So you have additional structures and this is structure which is almost as big as a municipal hall of an average town in the Philippines. In 1999 also, after that discovery, I delivered a privileged speech and I said, the real long-term target of China is not only this brief. And I told them that their target really is Carbono Show. This Carbono Show is part of China's military projection at the South China Sea. That was in 1999. And at that time, nobody believed me. 
Some people even accused me of being uh, an alarmist. But uh, I was, uh, I flew in the area with uh, Congressman Rora Baker of uh, California. This is Carbono Soul uh, of San Bales, uh, for those that uh, this is uh, in Luzon. Uh, some people may dismiss it as a small body of water. In fact, uh, and, and, you know, I'd like to address uh, the body here because I think uh, more than anybody else, you are in the best position to understand that a small rock may not necessarily be small in military value, in naval value, because some civilians uh, sometimes ask the question, why fight over small rocks as though you, you measure the importance of, uh, of a piece of property in number of square meters? Well, why fight over small rocks? You know, in warfare and geopolitics, the potential force of a territory is not necessarily proportionate to the size of that territory. It is the location, the strategic location that ter determines how much potential and in the end, how much kinetic force can be brought to bear from that territory. How well one can project power, gain access to a bigger objective, or conversely, prevent access or deny access using that piece of territory, however small. And we should learn from history. Note how the Pacific War was won using small atolls, rocks, islets with names like Truk, Tulaki, Saipan, Guadalain Atoll, Tarawa Atoll, etc., etc., dotting the vast Pacific Ocean uh, during the Second uh, World War in the Pacific Theater. And those who dismiss Calvary Soul as small may be wrong because uh, if you look at uh, the location of Calvary Soul, it is off Sambales, very close to our vital economic and military installations, Subic Club, Metro Manila, primary airports and seaports, power plants, Calabar Zone, and our Army, Navy, and Air Force bases. And it is not small also because the area of the lagoon inside is about 150 square kilometers. What is 150 square kilometers? It is almost the size of Quezon City. So imagine what you can do inside Quezon City, how many ships <coughs> you can put inside the Quezon City. And the lagoon's depth is sufficient for China's destroyers. In other words, it can be used as a naval base. And missiles can be ins installed there, which in a few minutes can land in targets in Central Luzon, Metro Manila, and Southern Tagalog. And if it is militarized, and I have no doubt that that is part of the grand plan of China, I'll, I'll be talking about that later, it can be transformed into another unsinkable aircraft carrier. I'd like to cite the example of Uliti. Again, go, I'm going back to the Second World War. Uh, there is Uliti about 1,000 miles from Leyte. On the eve of the Battle of Leyte Gore, on the eve of the landing of the Allied forces uh, in Leyte, Uliti was used as a harbor. It is about one-third the size of, uh, of Scarborough Shoal. It was used as a harbor for Admiral House's huge third peak that was the vanguard of the invasion of Japan occupied Philippines in 1944. And look at uh, uh, all the aircraft carriers are there, battleships, destroyers, transport ships were accommodated inside that uh, quote-unquote small uh, area. That's really and that's back of the Muslim look. China grabbed Scarborough Shoal in April 2012 after uh, a few days of a standoff there. And uh, now it is uh, like a dagger pointed at our vital installations on Luzon and the rest of the Philippines. And just to show you what is happening there, we were furnished a video by a Japanese uh, television company of a video supplied to them by Filipino fishermen because uh, this, was the, this has been the traditional fishing grounds of fishermen from uh, Zambales and from Pakistan who have been fishing there for hundreds of years but now cannot do it anymore without being harassed by uh, the Chinese Coast Guard. And here's uh, a video of what is happening there. Ah, okay. 
シナ海のサモロー礁で今年4月中国当局の船がフィリピンの漁船団に高圧放水を必要にやりせ船体や漁の道具などを破壊する様子が映されています
and uh, what used to be just a dark